Welcome back to the No Filter Weekly for episode number 11, a post NBA final series episode with our resident NBA analyst, Shay <laughs> Namdarian. Shay, how are you going? Yeah, good, <laughs> good, Steve. As always, doing well, doing well. Um, yeah, the NBA season just finished up, so it's uh, it's probably going to leave a little bit of a sports void for a lot of people out there, like myself. Mm -hmm. But um, I think uh, I feel like this season's I think it's gone for like three hundred and fifty odd days, so it's uh, it'll be good for uh, there to be a bit of a hiatus um, yeah. when it comes to NBA. So that's pretty. I mean, typically the season goes for about what eight months or so. So this year, because of COVID nineteen, yeah. it was pushed out by four months essentially. Well, it start yeah, it started um, October twenty second, two thousand nineteen, right? And then usually this, so the season, the new season should pretty much start in a week, right? Yeah. If we went by according to previous years, so um, yeah, like obviously COVID, and then they tried to shorten the, the remainder of the season and mm -hmm. finish it with in the bubble as well. So um. Yeah, it's a pretty long year. You can see why a lot of these players are just like excited to get the hell out of that bubble. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I, I saw our friend Ben Golliver, who appeared on the Ali Oop show recently, posting some final snaps uh, from the bubble and just walking around uh, the courts or one of the courts, literally yeah. with not many people in there and just taking it all in before he left the bubble. And Left the safety of the bubble out into Florida where they're registering <laughs> thousands of COVID-19 cases. Just, he'll break get it as soon as he opens the door. <laughs> uh, I wonder if any of the players have like some crazy anxiety as they make their way well, out. The crazy, like it's actually pretty incredible that they set up this bubble mm -hmm. and they were able to finish the season without anyone getting a case. Like there was all this um, talk about these NBA players, you know, they can't handle it. They'll bring, they'll sneak girls in, they'll sneak yeah. people in. You know, they'll bring the virus in, someone will get it. And I'm pretty sure there were zero cases the whole time. Like no one in the bubble got yeah. the virus, right? So yeah. it's uh, pretty incredible what they were able to do. Yeah, I think it's been an absolutely fantastic case study for what uh, other sports organizations around the world, something that they should aspire to. Like the way the NBA almost seamlessly pulled this off with minimal incident. I mean, obviously the TV ratings were down um, and that's attributable to numerous factors. But, yeah. you know, the, the Zoom crowds, the um, social distancing of the bubble, the way they pulled this together, um, to my mind, was just representative of how far ahead the NBA is when it comes to technology and innovation in, yeah. in general. And yeah. they've been leading the way for, for years now. Yeah, it's um, I just just thinking back, I remember there were some, of the, some of these coaches, you know, they're in their 70s, right? A lot of them were like, I, I don't want to go to the bubble because I'm scared I'm going to die. Like that was kind of yeah. the talk that people were having prior to going in. So, yeah, the fact they're able to do it, like you said, and kind of, you know, add those innovations along like, along the way, like the um, the crowds and, and, and uh, yeah, the cameras as well. I'm pretty sure I think there was only one there's only one cameraman in every stadium or mm. in, in each game. It's all like, you know, automatic cameras moving around and, and filming everything, which is pretty cool. And yeah, just the, I, I think the the craziest thing was, I don't know whether you saw the um, the end and how they did their speeches at the end, they were celebrating. It's, I don't know, just watching it, it seems that it's very hard to watch a team celebrating with no crowd. Mm. Like, you can hear everything, you can hear every word every player is saying, and, you know, they're just celebrating, they're trying to create that, you know, that vibe themselves without actually having a crowd there. It was just very odd and bizarre to watch. So hopefully... Um, next year we'll be able to have more crowds and and just building on what you said around the um the success of the bubble as well um what they're looking to do next year is depending on whether you know we can have crowds properly you know back or not um they're looking to do like experiment with something similar but have short-term bubbles like you know mm -hmm. three or four weeks players go there they bust out you know 10 20 games they leave the bubble have spend time with their family and then go into another one for another month and they're spread across um the country so um uh, yeah, that'll be interesting, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Yeah, definitely. Well, before we kick on with our conversation on the Lakers Heat NBA Final Series, we've got some words here from LBJ. Let's cut to him. Jeannie, I told Jeannie when I came here that uh, I was going to put this franchise back in a position where it belongs. Um, her late great father did it for so many years, and she just, you know, took it on after that. And for me to be a part of such a historical franchise is uh, it's an unbelievable feeling not only for myself, but for my teammates, for the organization, for the coaches, for the trainers, everybody that's here. Um, we just want our respect. Rob wants his respect. 
Coach Vogel wants his respect. Our organization wants their respect. Laker Nation wants their respect. And I want my damn respect, too. So, uh, interesting to see uh, Rob, Rob Lowe in the background there. He still looks like he's 25 he looks, years uh, old. It, lo- it looks exactly like him. I know. So, um, yes. Are you, wait, wait, are you saying you think, uh, you think he looks like Rob Lowe or do you actually think that's Rob Lowe? That's not Rob Lowe. <laughs> oh, really? It looks like you're, it's a dead ringer though. That's Because uh, I know their, Rob Lowe is a huge Lakers fan and he's often courtside. So. No, no. That's, so that's their, um, I think it's their... GM or he's he's pretty much the guy that, that <laughs> manages like the Rob team, Lowe. right? Yeah, yeah, no, dead ringer. I, like I, I didn't That's even hilarious. think about it, but you're right. He's um he's essentially a dead ringer for Rob Lowe. Um, so <laughs> you know it's funny with LeBron. Um, it's like he's he's one of those sports people or NBA players anyway that just gets hated on so much for even yeah. though he's achieved so much, he's done played so well. He's you know he's broken all these records. People mm-hmm. just continue to hate on the guy, and I think you know obviously with that speech, you can tell that he's probably getting a little bit sick of, you know, all the haters out there, you know, what else can the guy do apart from, you know, maybe have won a, a few more than four championships in the, yeah. in the 10 finals appearances he's yeah. gone to. Well, that's it. And uh, as, as we know now, I mean, I, I called it correctly a couple of weeks ago saying that yeah, Lakers would win it in six. Uh, <laughs> that was my expert opinion, of course. But um, <laughs> look, I think there's many different ways you can look at it when it comes to greatest of all time. Of course, Jordan won six of six, but LeBron's been to 10 NBA finals. He went to like eight final se- series in a row uh, before um, before joining the Lakers in 2018, 2019, 2018, 2019. Yeah. Um, but he has done something that Jordan and many other legends haven't, which is to win an NBA championship with three different teams, which speaks volumes about him Um in a way that perhaps, you know, Jordan spent years looking for his first ring at the Bulls and it wasn't until they recruited the likes of Pippen and Horace Grant that he had that team around him that he was capable of winning that. Now, of course, the same could be said of LBJ. I mean, 2018-19 had a lot of youngsters around him and it wasn't until they got Dwight Howard and Anthony Davis that they now had a team that could contend for the championship. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I will always say Michael Jordan just because I grew up in that era, but it's hard to look past all of these feats, despite the fact that LeBron James has won just four rings from his 10 appearances in the finals. Yeah. And, and obviously Michael Jordan was six out of six as well. And so I read something recently and it was an interesting point with um, um, Michael Jordan in the last dance, how obviously Phil Jackson was his coach across the whole time he was at the Bulls. Right. And there was a point there where he's like, I'm not playing without Phil, Phil Jackson coaching. Like he's the mm-hmm. one I want to coach. And you think about LeBron, LeBron's like, had so many different coaches and he just continues to win with different coaches. He doesn't need that stability when it comes to his head coach. So I thought that was a really interesting point where, you know, Jordan just didn't want to play under anyone else. Whereas LeBron's quite, um, quite able to, you know, go under any coach and still win um, yeah. no matter where he is, um, which is, I think is a, a testament to him and something that people kind of forget about as well. Yeah. That's a great point. And uh, it's also worth noting that when LeBron went to Miami, I believe Every team he's moved to, he won them a ring within two years of moving there. So Miami, then back to Cleveland, Cleveland. now at the Lakers again in his second season at the Lakers, which speaks volumes. And the guy's guy's literally two months from turning 36. So it's just like nuts. He was interviewed as well and they were asking him, you know, how how much longer do you think you have? And he said, I feel like I've got a lot longer to play. I think what's probably going to stop him is whether he wants to you know, retire and spend more time with his family and do other stuff. But his son's pretty much like, I think a year or two away from entering the NBA, probably a couple of years now. And um, he, mm-hmm. his dream is to play with his son. So I'm pretty sure he'll still be on the Lakers when he's like 40. He'll be playing with <laughs> LeBron, uh, Bronny, LeBron James Jr. Yeah. Um, and they'll probably be winning a championship together, which would be like one of the craziest sports stories in history. That's awesome. Um, and it's it's funny because you're absolutely right. You know, he's almost 36. And by this point, most players are just happy to still be on a roster, maybe getting some minutes, maybe lucky to shoot the occasional double-digit point game. Yeah. Whereas LeBron, I mean, if you look at his career statistics, he's pretty much as good as he has ever been. 2019-2020, he scored 25.3 points a game, just two points shy of his career average of 27. Um He's he's still shooting, you know, 34% from the field, 7.4 assists per game. He's just still a, you know, 
insurmountable opponent. He's, he's someone yeah. he's right up there with 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 the best right now with Yanis and everyone else. Well, he nearly won the MVP. It was like you know second yeah. place in the MVP this year. I mean, he was a distant like second nice. place, but he was still yeah, second still place. Second place, yeah. yeah. Which is and he won the NBA Finals nice. MVP. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So yeah, and man, like it's yeah, it's pretty incredible. But like I said, he's doing all this stuff. He's he's probably going to finish his career leading every statistical like category, like points scored, you know, assists, rebounds, mm-hmm. whatever, right? But um, everyone will still hate on him because he doesn't probably have that um, killer instinct that Jordan had, right? He doesn't have that. You know, he's he's not as fierce of a competitor as Jordan was in his time. And I think, you know, mm. there's plays where LeBron will, you know, they're one point down, there's 20 seconds left, and LeBron will drive it in the lane and then pass it out to someone else to make the winning shot, right? Whereas... Well, isn't that, that person, what happened in yeah, game five? Well, that's what happened, yeah. Like this um, Danny Green, his teammate, like he had a wide open three, he missed it. And everyone was like, LeBron, you suck. You should have taken the shot yourself. Why are you passing it off, right? But if you made it, people would be like, oh, good on that guy for making it, right? And it'll be nothing Always. to do with LeBron. And um, that um, Danny Green, he ended up getting all these death threats, him and his family, after he missed that three as well, man. So it's pretty, uh, it's okay, it's a ruthless sport. It's, it's a bit like uh, Escobar, the Colombian oh, yeah, that's right. soccer player uh, back in 1994. I remember World this, Cup yeah. when he scored that own goal and unfortunately on his return to Colombia he was gunned down and essentially murdered yeah. in cold blood for uh yeah, yeah for putting Colombia's World Cup hopes uh in the balance which that's like next level kind of uh, like I guess getting a few death threats on Twitter is probably not as bad as um as what that Colombian player yeah I'd, I'd much rather get the uh death threats on yeah. Twitter um but just before we wrap up with the Lakers and the 2020 <laughs> NBA season uh it's probably worth noting that they've done this on the back of not making the playoffs for six consecutive seasons. I mean, we think of the Lakers, we think of those crisp golden jerseys. You think of the seven, the 16 pennants that they had hanging from the arena at the Staples Center. You think about Magic Johnson, Kirby Bryant. But a lot of people who perhaps aren't close to the game wouldn't realize that the Lakers went through this terrible period where they didn't make the playoffs. They, they had one season where they just won, I think, 17 games in an 82 game season and even 2018 19 their first season with braun they, they didn't make the playoffs they had about 37 wins but they acknowledged that you know it was part of the rebuilding process that to get rid of some youngsters that to make you know get dispensed with a number of trade picks and through all of that through taking these big risks here they are and they're champions once again so perhaps there's something to be said about you know, I guess there's a philosophy to pull out of this, which is sometimes you got to take one step back to take two steps forward, and that's what the Lakers yeah. did over the past couple of seasons. Yeah, it's um, and it goes to show you that it's a uh, it's a business as well. I remember when um, LeBron decided to go to the Lakers, and they obviously had all these young players like Lonzo Ball or whatever, right? And um, LeBron James will be you know sending a tweet saying, you know, I can't wait to come to the Lakers. Um, and he tweets Lonzo Ball. He's like, we're going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And then one year later, he's like, Lonzo Ball, get out of here. What Anthony Davis. So it's um, <laughs> it's quite funny how quickly things change. And um, it just shows you if you don't win, it, it, when you've got a star like LeBron, if you're not winning, someone's going to have to obviously pay the price, right? And someone's going to have to be moved on. And uh, that obviously happened within the, within a year. And um, that's, it's good, though, because it, it shows you that these players, like, obviously LeBron James has been playing for, what, 18, 17 years or something, right? Mm-hmm. But these players, they don't have a lot of years in their careers, right? So, you know, they can't be piss fighting around for five, six years, build, helping build a roster. They want to win and they want to win now, right? And they need to make the moves uh, to be able to do that. Did you see um, Did you see any of the footage from Staples Center? Like the crowd going nuts, like celebrating no, after the win? No. Apparently the cops were like arresting like, hundreds of people, got, hundred people got arrested, buildings were getting damaged. It's just, yeah. uh, it's, it's pretty funny, like how people react to like sporting wins. I remember when... Um, when Richmond Tigers in the AFL in Australia, when they won their flag, first flag for like 30, 40 years, the streets in Richmond, you, I think you went as yeah, well. Yeah, I don't I know. We're just getting just destroyed. Everyone's just going nuts, right? I don't know. How was it? Was it out of control? Look, or it, to me, miss- it seemed pretty tame, tame? Uh, yeah. to me. Okay. But this was the second uh, championship, the second premiership they won. Oh, okay, that's probably why then. The yeah, okay. period. The first one would have been nuts. Yeah, because the first one was their first premiership <laughs> yeah. in like, what, 30 years or something? 30 odd years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, look... Uh, I think uh, downtown LA, apart from the Staples Center, is not a very glamorous place. So if fans are 
rioting and looting and setting stuff on fire there. Well, who knows? It might make an improvement on downtown <laughs> LA, which is it's might one clean of, it's, it up a little bit. It's, it's an interesting thing. It's like one of those cities where you just don't go downtown. Like every other city, you go to New York. You know, you go to London. You know, a lot of the the buzz, a lot of the energy is downtown. Whereas yeah. in LA, it's like no, you just stay away from there. You you head to uh, West Hollywood. You head to uh, Orange County, south of LA. You you head to Venice Beach. Anywhere and everywhere, but downtown LA as a tourist. But um, nice. <laughs> we we shall uh, leave this one with uh, just congratulating LA on their seventeenth championship. Now speaking of finishing first, I also had the pleasure of finishing first this week at a uh, not quite. <laughs> a basketball tournament, but a tournament all the same. Super Mario Bros. 35. It is the battle royale that Nintendo launched exclusively to the Nintendo Switch just last week. And I know you own a Switch yourself. Have you had a chance to download this bad <laughs> I boy? I haven't played it yet. So um, I guess um, make this clear to me. Like, what, what is the game? So are you literally just playing a Mario level? against 30 odd other people and the first one to finish the level wins. Is that pretty much? Well, not, not quite. So it's not about finishing the level. It's about being the last one standing. Um, so you have yeah 35 people and, and the levels are more or less based on Super Mario Bros, the original uh, yeah. classic. And so you've got like level one, one, four, one, all the way up to eight, eight, four. Now, yeah. I thought it was about finishing the level. I thought it was about more coins. It's really just about being the last one standing. But the more um, critters you 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 kill, you know, the more uh, mushrooms and whatnot you, you stamp on and all that sort of stuff. The more turtles you kill, you basically get um, more time. So time, it's about uh. making sure you have a lot of time. Otherwise, if you run out of time, you're done. Um, and also. As a player in Battle Royale, as the name suggests, you can send enemies to the other players. So basically, I'm just trying to stay along as, alive as long as possible. I'm trying to kill my opponents by sending enemies their way. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. And, you know, I um, grew up playing this game. And, and it's one of those things. It's like riding a bicycle. Like uh, within five or ten minutes, I was back to my best. I was running through levels. <laughs> you know, I had nothing but fireballs the whole time. And I came like second and third about seven or eight times in a row. And I, I was just, my my sole purpose in life at that moment was to finish first. <laughs> and I eventually managed it um, against a, t a, a s entire parade of what I imagine were Japanese teens because you can actually see the people's names and there was names, just yeah. nothing but Japanese characters on the screen. <laughs> so I'm, I was feeling pretty proud of myself so, and I haven't played it since. So how long, how long does, um, does the game take? Uh, typically, well, it could take five seconds five, if minutes? you lose straight away. Okay, yeah. but Generally on average? To, to win, I, I think you basically need to stay alive for about 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Um, which sounds a lot harder, sounds a lot easier yeah, yeah. than it is. No, nah, no, nah, it's pretty hard. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, definitely check it out. Um, however, given uh, Nintendo's best efforts to celebrate the 35th anniversary of Super Mario Bros., uh, Gamers are already hacking the game. Uh, there's apparently all sorts of cheat codes that people are, are using to dominate, which makes me feel even better about my victory because <laughs> it was all pure talent, no cheat codes here. Um, but yeah, apparently this is nothing new when it comes to these battle royale uh, type games. So um, anyway, it was launched on October the 1st. And if you have a Switch, you should definitely check it out. It's a free download on the Nintendo eShop. <laughs> It makes it makes sense now. So it's the 35th anniversary of the first Mario coming out, right? Because they're they're bringing out a lot of these. Um, I think the Switch is bringing out all the Mario titles in one game as well, so people can play that as well. And then, have you seen Mario Kart? So Mario Kart's coming out with this thing called Mario Kart Live. I think it is where you literally get these physical, like a physical Mario in a cart, and you use you race them around your house like with it's I've uses mixed this. reality AR. It's it's pretty nuts. Like is it? I don't know. I feel like I feel like it's one of those things where you'll play it once and just get over it. It just kind of it's more of a novelty. But yeah. literally, you'll play Mario Kart and this little kart is driving around your house, and you can actually see all the different parts of your house in the game that you're playing. So it's kind of like you're going around your bookshelf in the house and things like that. So it, it could be pretty cool. But like I said, it's something that you probably play once or twice and then get over it. Yeah. So I imagine you first need to like map your house yeah, or something yeah, you into map it AR yeah. and then 
Okay. Yeah, they've got these um these physical like they're called hurdles or something where you put them in different locations in the house and you kind of create a track mm-hmm. and then from there you um you race um <laughs> yeah anyway it's not out yet I think it comes out literally in a couple of days but it'll be interesting to see what the reviews are like. Well, isn't there um an actual physical Mario Kart track in in Japan? Oh, I don't know, but so you it can is, actually it sounds race pretty cool. on the street. <laughs> Japan Mario Kart, yeah. So there's it's an actual thing here. That's so, so cool. You can see some images. You get to dress <laughs> up, and I don't know what they do about throwing, you know, missiles and stuff at other Pretty competitors. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so it is a thing. Although I don't think it has like anything to do with Nintendo because I'm just reading here that Nintendo <laughs> wins so lawsuit against alleged Mario Kart impersonators. <laughs> Interesting. So I, um, I've always wanted to go to Japan. Now I've got another reason to go. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. It's uh yeah driving especially in Japan I mean I think the backdrop is just so suited to what these guys for what Mario Kart is all about That's but um cool. moving on from the gaming world to the music world uh, the music world lost one of its biggest names one of its most influential names last week uh, the great Eddie Van Halen and I know you're more of a hip hop fan than a rocker but <laughs> yeah. you could consider Eddie Van Halen who would I equate him to? Maybe like the Grandmaster Flash of hip hop. Like he kind of just created a whole new genre and reinvented music in a way. Yes, and he was like super young. Like he was only 65, right? Was yeah. it 60 odd? Yeah, which is like obviously not crazy old. So um, no, I obviously didn't follow him too much when I, when I was uh, younger, but um, sounds like he's left a pretty big hole in the in the rock um, kind of landscape. Yeah, I mean, he, another way to look at it is perhaps Steve Jobs of, of rock music because it wasn't just someone who wrote songs or innovated around songwriting. He innovated around his guitar tone. So he would basically build his own guitars using pieces from different brands like Gibson and Fender. And he'd have this tone that guitarists around the world just tried to copy but just couldn't get it to sound um, the nice. same way. Um, and then he just created different techniques for playing the guitar um, including a technique called tapping, which basically went on to be used by guitarists worldwide, especially throughout throughout the 80s. So Van Halen were like a good five or six years ahead of their time um, and went on to sell about 85 million records. And um, for those of our listeners who may not be familiar with the great Van Halen, I'm just going to play a really... Whoop, not this one. I'm turning that off. Um, a really short clip, which... Basically, it gives you an insight as to what to expect. So this is Eruption from Van Halen from the 1978 album. It was basically a guitar solo. It was one minute long. I'm going to play you about 30 seconds of it just to give you an insight as to what Eddie Van Halen was all about. You got that in. So I'm not sure if you could actually hear that on your end. I, I could hear a little bit of it, but um, yeah. no, it's, it sounded uh, pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anyone wants to uh, hear a bit more, they can find Van Halen on YouTube. I recommend their debut album. Mm-hmm. Van Halen 1 released in February of 1978. So, so with Van Halen, right, just um, so I've um, got my understanding clear. How many people were in the actual band? So obviously he was the the lead it was it like three or four guys yeah so there's four guys in the band okay. essentially and he was the guitarist so he wrote a lot yeah, of the okay. songs he played the guitar but he wasn't the the front man and the front man was david lee roth who was you know like an iconic front man he basically created the template that a lot of other singers in the 80s particularly followed like the look the the way he danced the way he moved the way he sung he was like the the template essentially for people yeah. who came after him, like Vince Neil from Motley Crue, for example. Um, yep. 
But it's funny because there was this venue that Van Halen used to play at. And perhaps there's something to unpack here. Like Van Halen, before they released their first album, they toured for, well, they played for about six years. And they would play about four to five nights a week. And they would predominantly play dingy clubs, biker bars, high school parties, anywhere and everywhere they could get a gig, they would play. And that gave them the opportunity to more or less hone their craft so that when they got their big break, they were just like dominating from day one. Their live show was just, you know, lit as the kids would say these days. <laughs> um, but they got a residency in, in LA around 77 at a place called Gazari's, which was a huge rock and roll bar in West Hollywood in the Sunset Strip. And something to be said there because they said, well, we're not going to keep playing these high school gigs. We're going to position ourselves somewhere where we're going to be seen by industry insiders who make decisions, who hand out record deals. And Gazari, Bill Gazari was this 60 something year old dude at the time. He used to wear like a top hat. He looked like a gangster. And he would actually call the singer of the band. So he'd call David Van because he thought <laughs> <laughs> he thought his name was Van Halen, yeah. but the singer, even though that was the surname of Eddie and his brother Alex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's fu it's funny with these certain like um, like I see Van Halen, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, all I think about is Eddie Van Halen, for example, because the name the name of the band's pretty much his surname, right? It's kind of like yeah. John Bon Jovi, you know, you got Bon oh, Jovi, yeah. and like, yeah, it's uh, like what I, I just always wondered why rock groups do this is it just kind of like just sounds cool these surnames they I mean, just work with them yeah i mean it's not the most common thing in the world but you're right like bon jovi there's a couple of, there's a couple of them out yeah, there yeah yeah bon jovi is a band it's funny sometimes yeah. you hear people say oh yeah i, I like bon jovi he's got great <laughs> yeah. music i'm like it's actually a band and, and john bon jovi <laughs> has I mean. a solo career which is separate to yeah. bon jovi yeah, uh, yeah yeah which is nuts yeah, yeah i'm yeah. probably one of the culprits of, of saying that in the past oh, and then yeah. i realize i'm like shit i'm wrong you know it's actually a, a band not just one guy right so um yeah, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Maybe yeah. they're the only two. I'm sure there's others out there, but they're the two that come to mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, just real quickly, I mean, you touched on Bon Jovi. Um, he, they've, he, I was about to say he based on the back, based on our conversation, but they've actually released a new song uh, just the other, well, a couple of weeks ago, which is called American Reckoning, which is all about the protests going on in the States right now, basically reflecting on the murder of George Floyd. Um, oh, yeah. and, and John Bon Jovi's basically said, look, I, you know, he more or less feels that, you know, he is the embodiment of white privilege. He's like, look at me, I've got everything. Um, so I had to be really careful about how I positioned this song. Um, I, you know, checked the lyrics with a lot of friends, people of color, et cetera, to make sure that I wasn't overstepping any lines. And he basically said, look, we're not trying to, um, take sides this is just us reflecting on this moment um it's not about political beliefs it's not about anything of that persuasion it's just about us weighing in and perhaps not being silent in a time when um silence is just as bad as perhaps doing the wrong thing so um yeah uh, some of the lyrics america's on fire there's protests in the streets her conscience has been looted and her soul is under siege another mother's crying as history repeats I can't breathe. So there you go. If you want to listen to that song, check it out. I'm sure it is on YouTube. It is called American Reckoning. Nice one. What do you, do you reckon it's a good song? Have you you've heard it? I actually came across this news 17 seconds before we jumped on this call. Oh, so wow. There you go. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't heard it yet. So it was just incidental that you happened to mention Bon Jovi. Oh, nice. And I had something nice to song, talk about that was of note and recent about the band. Um, Moving on from Bon Jovi, I mean, still in the entertainment world, Kanye West, I mean, there's been a lot of speculation over the past couple of years about him finally making an appearance on the Joe Rogan experience. Now, he just today tweeted something, and I'm going to pull out my phone because our good mutual friend, <laughs> Honor, who I know is listening to this because he is perhaps our biggest fan, <laughs> tweeted or shared this in our WhatsApp. And basically um, Kanye said, would love to go on Joe Rogan's podcast live this week. I have my team trying to get your number, Joe. I mean, Calabasas, let's do this, my friend. And he's got a little emoji of a skier going downhill, hopefully not symbolic of Kanye West's uh, <laughs> mental state right now. Um, I think that would make, that would make for a, Oh, interesting conversation to say the least for sure for sure um 
I'm sure Rogan would jump at the chance to get Kanye on just to kind of, I don't know, talk, talk crap. And I'm sure it'll get a lot of views as well online, you know, similar to uh, it, the Elon, Elon Musk. Musk interview. Yeah, it'll kind of grow his listener base as well. I'm sure Spotify would love it uh, yeah. as well to grow the listener base. Definitely. And it's, it's funny because Kanye, I mean, I actually saw him, and this was before I had any real interest in Kanye at Big Day Out in like 2000 and... I don't know, 13 or 14. Um, I think it was the last big day out. And this was when I was making my way back from, you know, seeing Soundgarden or some rock band. And I caught a couple of songs, but it wasn't really my thing. And I, and I took off. Um, but from what I understand of Kanye, like he is very much, and I have to say, I've since discovered his catalog and actually like some of the stuff, um, particularly some of his more commercial stuff, uh, yeah. like the album that Stronger is on. I quite oh, yeah. enjoyed that. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure all the uh, well, Kanye, Yeezy, Faithful are like I oh, yeah, so uh, so predictable. But um, <laughs> I kind of enjoyed it. It was accessible. Well, yeah, <laughs> I actually really liked his um like his first album or two, and yeah. then after that, I don't know. So he just kind of went a bit nuts and crazy. Like his first album was pretty much very much like a hip hop kind of album, and um, you know, he I think he produced most of it on yeah. there and created all the music and stuff. And then the second one was was similar to the first one. Then after that, it just kind of became some, mm. I don't know, he just went, went a bit sideways. He experimented a bit more and and all that and probably wasn't my cup of tea. But uh, And then he became a bit more crazy as well. I think the more albums he brought out, the crazier he became came well, as well. Well, this is the thing. I mean, he's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, right? Yeah. But apparently he or and or the people closest to him don't want him to get treatment because a lot of his, say, genius or creativity comes from that mental disorder, if you want to call it that, yeah. um, which is interesting. And you know, people often make the claim that when it comes to great art, whether it's music or comedy or, or even entrepreneurship, you've got to be a little bit crazy to see things that other people don't. And if you don't have that, then you just basically come across as vanilla and just mimicking everyone else. And, you know, Eddie yeah. Van Halen had that. And it seems like Kanye West has that as well. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, even his story, even to, you're right about the creativity. Cause like for him, that's like his, his number one weapon, right? Is his creativity. And I remember he got his big, he was doing like um, a few, he was producing a few songs for like Jay Z back in the day. And that's where he got his big break. And, you know, Jay Z kind of looked at Jay-Z as his big brother and like helping him out in the early days. I don't know how close they are now, whether they you had know, a Beyonce. Falling out. Wasn't there a song yeah. like that? Uh, I, I, I don't Kanye know, but I, I, I wonder if like Beyonce, like Kanye, Jay-Z and um, Kim Kardashian are all hanging out together. I don't know. It seems like a, a weird bunch to hang out, but I remember it just reminds me on Kanye's first album. He had this song. It was the last song on the album. It was called Last Call and it went for like 10 to 15 minutes and it was literally him doing a song, but also telling a story as well. And I think, that just, yeah, you're right. It's kind of, he's very creative and like that's not a typical thing you see on a hip hop album, but it worked really well. And it kind of, um, yeah, it was a really uh, good insight into his like life and his story as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we will wait with bated breath yeah, let's as see. to whether or not Ye makes an appearance mm -hmm. on the Joe Rogan experience this week. One person who is vying to make an appearance on the Joe Rogan experience is yours truly. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately for me, it's not so much a matter of just jumping onto Twitter and saying, hey, Joe, let's do this. I'm going all out for what is perhaps a 0.1% chance of making it onto the Joe Rogan experience. But what I have is a box with my, a copy of my latest book, a handwritten note, and then a whole bunch of Australian treats that I am sending to Joe Rogan. Uh, we're talking Tim Tams. We're talking Vegemite. We're talking T2T, Melbourne morning, Melbourne breakfast <laughs> tea, as well as some shapes, some good old-fashioned honest shapes. Even though he is all about his fitness, yeah. I'm sure if he shares them with uh, Jamie, then there won't be too much of a calorie burden there. But uh you know, these are the things you have to do as, a, as an entrepreneur who's trying to get out there um, and for sure. making himself... So separate right. yourself, right? Well, that's exactly right. And going back to Kanye, going back to Eddie Van Halen, how can you do things differently so that people will actually pay attention to you? And, you know, there are no guarantees. You could try all the things and you still might fail. But as Theodore Roosevelt said, you'd rather fail. Actually, you'd rather 
yeah, you'd rather fail than be in that cold and timid place where you know yeah. neither victory nor defeat. For sure, for sure. So let's see, fingers crossed uh, someone in his team gets it or he gets it and he's like, yeah, man, come on, <laughs> let's do this. You know what's kind of uh, the, the sad part of it is <laughs> if 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 that was to happen, the, what, what do you say, 0.01% chance yep. it does happen. Um Who's to say you can even leave Melbourne to, to do an interview? <laughs> I'll worry about that later. I actually had a look online as to uh, how you get out of the country. Exemptions? Yeah. Exemptions. Mm-hmm. And so they say there was two things. There was One was around business purposes. And okay. I think I can make a claim for this being business purposes. I mean, being a, an author, a published author, uh, promotional purposes, you could say. So that's yeah. one. Uh, and of, of course, I mean, it's not like I'm going over there to be on some PC little podcast with 20 listeners uh it is the Joe Rogan experience which everybody knows so I think that's one the second one yeah. is if you plan to be out of the country for three months or more then you also get an exemption so okay I think uh, look let's cross that bridge yeah we get to. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But it's good to know there the options are there if you if you need them the or if anyone needs them right the, the options, options are there, there. and uh yeah. look I would quite happily self-quarantine for 14 days upon my return to yeah. Australia for the opportunity. And uh, it's not just Rogan. I've got about 12 boxes, 12 packages going out to um, some of the biggest podcasters in the domain of, you know, personal development, business, curiosity, and so on. So uh, we'll see what comes of that. Awesome. I'll report back on the show, no doubt, yeah, if something sure. comes of it. Um, but still in the world of uh, media and entertainment, Disney has actually gone ahead and restructured its media and entertainment division. So the company says that because of the coronavirus, you know, their theatrical business, you know, the theme parks and everything else has basically been crippled. And so now what they're looking to do is accelerate their direct to consumer strategy. Um, They're centralizing their media business into a single organization that will be responsible for content, ad sales, and Disney plus. So basically they're trying to be the new Netflix. Have you, um, I mean, you've got a young daughter. Have you thought about signing up to Disney plus? Uh, so no, I've got, I've got Disney plus, but um, oh, you've got to be honest, like I rarely, I rarely go on there just because it's one of those platforms that doesn't generally have a lot of new content. So a lot of mm-hmm. new stuff's not really coming out on there. Cause they, their catalogs pretty much made up of, you know, all your Pixar, Disney classics, yeah. Pixar stuff, your Marvel stuff. Right. But over the last year, it's not like, you know, new things have really been created to put on there. Whereas you see Netflix is coming out with new stuff every week and they're really building their catalog. So mm. um, Disney though, they um, they have, uh, they put Mulan on there. So obviously there's some movies out there that they were going to release to cinemas. And obviously they're like, well, shit, we can't do that anymore. So they've released it on Disney Plus. They had Mulan, but they were charging people, I think like 30, 35 bucks to even be able to watch that, but on Disney Plus only. So yep. they're doing that. And um, there's also... There's another movie coming out. I saw the trailer for it a little while ago. It's called, um, it's with Jamie Foxx called Soul. It's a Pixar movie, right? Mm-hmm. You love your Pixar movies. So I'm sure you'll, uh, you'd love it. But um, yeah, I don't know what the exact storyline is, but um, yeah, Jamie Foxx plays this, um, I think he's a, he plays a piano or the saxophone or something and he loses his soul or I don't know. It's, it's a story about the soul. And um, yeah, like they're going to release it on Disney Plus for free, or you're not gonna, you're not gonna have to pay thirty bucks for it like Mulan. Mm-hmm. Um, I think on December twenty um, fifth, like Christmas Day. Um, but I think it's kind of hitting home a little bit. Um, obviously, given this change by Disney, but also the fact they're releasing these cinema made movies to Disney Plus and these streaming services, it's hitting home to the the theaters and cinemas out there that they're pretty, <laughs> they're pretty screwed, right? They're relying on these big fucking please big movies to bring in audience to actually watch watch them in the theater. So um, yeah, they're really looking at, you know, how they're really going to su- survive moving forward as well. There we go. You got a screenshot of, uh, so that guy, uh, Jamie Foxx plays this character. Yeah. It looks fantastic. Soul. You'd love it. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> love it movie. reminds me of Eddie, uh, early Eddie Murphy with that mustache. <laughs> Take <laughs> off the glasses and you've got Eddie Murphy. Yeah, yeah. Put, put on a uh, leather, red leather jumpsuit red leather and you've got Delirious. <laughs> Classic. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I mean, to your point about there not being that much content on or new content on Disney Plus, that's part of their strategy with this yeah. restructure is to basically um, focus on creating a lot of content. Um, you know, whether it's Walt Disney Studios, Marvel, Pixar, Walt Disney Animation, Lucasfilm, 20th Century Studios, and Searchlight. I mean, all these 
brands are under their umbrella now. So they'll be creating a lot more content for that. Um, and that's part of what Netflix essentially did. I mean, initially they were just licensing other people's content. And of course, over the past half decade, they've really been aggressive about creating their own content. And that's been, again, like we said, a differentiator for them. Mm. It's given them a massive competitive um, advantage. And uh, interesting to note that Disney actually laid off about 28,000 workers um, because of the downturn in obviously the, the non events, the, the non attendance at, at their many parks in California, Florida, and around the world. So, yeah. pretty devastating for those people. But of course, Disney, like any species that aims to survive in a difficult environment, needs to uh, adapt. Yeah. Well, they would have got a. A decent cash injection from the NBA being played at Disney Disney World, right? Um, but mm. obviously that's finished now. So, yeah, it's kind of back to square one. How do they make the most of these theme parks? Are they still – are these theme parks – like I'm not sure what's going on in America. Like who knows half the time. But are these theme parks actually closed or are people just not going to them? I believe they're, they're closed. Okay. Uh, let me I, I'd have no idea because, you know, from what I gather, it seems like a lot of people in the U.S. are just living life as per normal anyway, right? Just – dealing with the virus around them. Yeah, no, Disneyland in Anaheim, California is currently closed. Uh, obviously, Disney World in Florida yeah. um, has been home to the NBA bubble. That's been closed as well. And, and LA at the moment, like their situation over there is not great. Uh, like they don't have the same kind of lockdown that we have in Melbourne, despite yeah. having hundreds of times more cases. Um, but they are still encouraged to quarantine, not go out, not socialize. And I think there are yeah, okay. all sorts of um, restrictions in place at restaurants and and um, bars and things of that persuasion. So it's definitely not business as usual yeah. in Los Angeles or, or greater California to that point. Um, so yeah, Disney struggling big time. So hence the move to really yeah. pump up Disney Plus. That'll um, be good. It'll be good to get um, some more value for the money we're spending on it. So <laughs> that'll be good. Yeah, well, I'm sure once they pump out some new content, uh, yeah. your, your daughter will be just a little bit yeah. older and perhaps a little bit more uh, switched on to what's actually going on on the television. And yeah, she'll be sure. able to enjoy well, it a lot we, more as we well. We watched um, um, Space Jam a little while ago. Which How is, does she uh, respond to that? She would, nah, she, she loved it because, you know, it's got the combination of, uh, you know, basketball, but also cartoon in there as well. And uh, nah, she seemed to love it. And uh, she kept saying Michael Jordan afterwards. Like that was like <laughs> what she kept calling him. So it's good. It's like for me, it's, you know, childhood classic, watching it again. And, um, you know, Belle to watch it, their daughter is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, if you have a young kid out there, make sure you watch Space Jam. <laughs> Get onto them, it. Particularly Space Jam right, too, yeah. with LeBron's coming out, I think next US summer. So about yeah. a year from now, right? It'll uh, Space Jam 2 will be out. So that'll be interesting. Yeah, well, Space Jam too. I think it features Anthony Davis as well. As well, so yeah. Both of them will be in there, which is pretty, pretty fitting on the back of the championship win. It might, sure. maybe, it'll actually help to increase uh, downloads of Space Jam too. Although I think I was keen to watch it, regardless of whether or not <laughs> LeBron and uh, Davis yeah. pulled it off this week. Um, moving on from Disney to. Something else that perhaps is somewhat mystical to me that Yarraville, <laughs> my home suburb, has been named one of the coolest neighborhood neighborhoods in the world. I heard about this the other day. <laughs> I heard about this the other day. I think um Yarraville and Marrickville in Sydney, right? They were the two in Australia that were named in the top forty or something, right? But I like you live there, Steve. You tell us, <laughs> is it one, do you feel like it's one of the coolest suburbs in the world? Look, mate. <laughs> let's let's put it this way downtown la was also in the top five and we've already discussed that so yeah. uh the, the credibility <laughs> credibility of this list goes downhill quickly after what, you see what that. was our what was number one um i actually haven't got number one yeah, in list front okay. of me i believe it was potentially barcelona so uh, if you're curious about the remainder of the list esquera mm -hmm. esquera del exemple uh, totally ruined that pronunciation <laughs> in Barcelona. Yep. Took out the top spot followed by downtown in LA. Sham Shui Po in Hong Kong. I haven't even heard of Sham Shui Po and I've been to Hong Kong like seven <laughs> times. Like when I go to Hong Kong, it is, you know, LKF, it's Soho, it's maybe yeah. Sheng Wan, it's the mid levels. What, where is Sham Shui Po? <laughs> I've never heard of it. But it's, it's probably a local thing, right? It's like people that visit Melbourne will never know about Yarraville, right? They're hanging around. And the they, CBD neither and, should they. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like look, look, Yarraville is a cool little neighborhood. I've always maintained that it's kind of like a 
a small country town, five k's from the city. It's it's cool. It's unique. It's got a heritage listed theater, which I know you've taken your your wife to on one yeah, occasion. Yeah. It's a really yeah. cool theater. Like it's lots of cool little cafes and whatnot. But top five neighborhood, cool coolest neighborhood in the world. It is not. I mean, well, it's probably uh, it lies in. Obviously, you might not think it is, but. It might it might be a good thing for uh for the price of your house. You might have just gone up a little bit, you know, with news like this. <laughs> oh, look, I'm happy for my the price of my house to, to go up. But when I compare Yarraville to say Greenwich Village in in New York, where you have you know the comedy cellar and you've got street ball and you've got cool night spots and bars and you know NYU and the student ecosystem, like that place is a thousand times cooler. Um, and when you look at some of the things that they've pointed to here, so two lockdown stories sum it up for Yarraville. First, happy signs on walking tracks in the area. So these are these little uh, stickers or placards that they've put on trees in the park next to my house, which have little jokes on them. And you know what? They're quite pleasant, um, particularly the first day, but after 100 days of reading the same signs, it <laughs> gets a bit old. And the second thing they've pointed to is skater Bell Hadiwi Jaja, who's been roller skating through the streets in rotating costumes to keep families entertained. These are the two things they point to as to why Melbourne got, as to why Yarraville got the coolest suburb. Now, neither <laughs> of these things really uh, amount to all that much compared to some of the actually cool neighborhoods in the world. So I've actually been looking to get out of Yarraville for the last two or three years. I just can't be bothered <laughs> with the administrative and logistical overhead of doing so. Nonetheless, like you said, I will take gladly take uh. the increase in property <laughs> prices. So thank you, time out for that. I mean, how much of this is really them picking different places every year to drive traffic to <laughs> well, their website it, right? and sell ads for eyeballs? Well, that's it. Like how much research is really going into deciding, you know, the top 40 coolest suburbs. Yeah. It's like when they name the, you know, the most livable cities in the world, like Melbourne's in the top five every year. They'll do it next year again and Melbourne will be in the top five again, even though it's probably one of the worst places to live right now because we can't do anything, right? So it's uh, it's, it's all for eyeballs, right? They, they'll make these lists. They'll just do it. They'll just pick whatever suburbs and they'll find a couple of cool things that separate one suburb from the others and, and just talk about it. 100%, man. And, yeah. um, like you said, I don't think much research goes into it, hence why downtown LA is number two on the list. Um, something else that's going on this week, week in the world of tech, uh, perhaps at the intersection of tech and, and uh, politics maybe, um, and censorship is Facebook banning Holocaust denial. Now, it's said that its decision is supported by well -documented, the well-documented rise in anti-Semitism globally and the alarming level of ignorance about the Holocaust, especially among young people. Um, have you read up on, on this? Do you know much about it? Uh, so I saw a little bit of it, but it just kind of, it's your typical Facebook thing where they keep chopping and changing their minds mm. and just kind of go, going with the flow as opposed to, uh, you know, making a stance and just sticking to it. I guess there's two ways to look at it. One is, you know, it's good that they're moving with the times and making adjustments based on data and information. But at the same time, it sounds like, you know, they're just getting bullied into doing things based on what people are talking. So it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's, it's a weird one. And they continue yeah. to do these kind of stuff. It's like what we talked about. I think it was last week or the week before just around um how uh, the censorship 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 stuff and they're like oh you know we're not censoring stuff and then yeah two, two weeks later they're like yeah we're gonna censor everything <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely man um it, look, it is a difficult one and like i'm a big believer that if you have a decision like you do change your decision in light of new evidence so like strong opinions yeah. weekly held essentially and something that zuckerberg has said which kind of echoes that is and you really have to take a lot of what Mark Zuckerberg says with a grain of salt because he is a bit of a I, – I feel like, and I think a lot of people share this sentiment, that he comes across like a very self-serving robot who will say or do what is best in the current circumstance to further his own mission and status. Yeah. Um, but he has said that, and I quote, I've struggled with the tension between standing for free expression and the harm caused by minimizing or denying the horror of the Holocaust – my own thinking has evolved as I've seen data showing an increase in anti-Semitic violence as have our wider policies on hate speech. Drawing the right lines between what is and isn't acceptable speech isn't straightforward, but with the current state of the world, I believe this is the right balance. And um, I think that's that's the key word, right? Balance. Yeah. Because you don't want to 
like we said a couple of weeks ago, it's like, where yeah. do you draw the line once you start? And, and of course, the Holocaust, the terrible thing and any, you know, anti-Semitic sentiments, for my mind, uh, you know, should not be, you know, amplified online. The question then becomes, though, if you start censoring one thing, where do you draw the line and who makes that decision? And that's always yeah. the difficult one uh, when it comes to these questions of, of online censorship. Yeah, I, I, I read this article as well and they, they mentioned... Um, you ran, obviously Trump had COVID. He came out and he was like talking about how, uh, man, the guy's nuts. That he was talking about how you know he 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 took some drug. I can't remember what the drug was. He took for like, hydroxychloroquine. It was something, right? And he's like, yeah, I felt better twenty four hours later. Um, and then apparently he was talking about how um, the flu is way more deadly than than coronavirus, and that was spreading across Facebook. And they obviously, I think uh, Zuckerberg or someone mentioned that they took it off Facebook just because. You know, obviously, it's it's just Trump being Trump. But yeah, I don't know, man. That guy is digging himself. He's digging himself a grave in terms of the like the, some of the stuff he's saying, man. Jesus, um, what yeah. do we have now? There's like three weeks left. Um, yeah, but I think with Trump, that that stuff sort of it works for him. It right? works it's for him. Thing. Like it's not it's no different to the 2016 election when he was saying all manner of things and outright lying, and then saying he didn't say what he said like an hour <laughs> earlier. Um, and it still got him the presidency. And uh, I think both sides of the political spectrum in the United States are kind of shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. And the person who shoots themselves in the foot the least will probably win. Yeah. Well, did, did you see um, the uh, vice presidential um, debate? And did you hear about the fly? Yeah. With oh. on, <laughs> on Pence's head. It's there's been all oh, sorts man, of that memes that have come out uh, on the back of that. So fly. good. Uh, it's uh, it's probably uh, I, I didn't watch that debate. Um, I didn't want to waste my time on it, but I heard about the fly, and apparently the fly was on there for about a good couple of minutes, right? So uh, <laughs> it's probably the highlight of uh, of the debate for sure. Oh yeah, there's a uh, <laughs> that fly is Mike Pence's only black friend. <laughs> is the number two meme. Number three, total time on head, two minutes. Unlike Pence, the fly respects the rules and left when its time was up. And one more, this toy is going to fly up the shelves. Mike Pence's head fly action figure. Oh, you get a fly, contents, one fly, non-flammable non action figure. Very good. Well, there you go. I think we're going to leave <laughs> this conversation on the high note. Um, and so if good. you have some spare time on your hands, definitely Google Mike Pence fly <laughs> memes, 47 of them to go through. Shay, <laughs> always a pleasure, my mate. You too, Steve. Enjoy uh, the rest yeah. of your day. We'll chat soon. See you. Cheers, dude. <laughs>